Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists... Today on The Microscopist, I'm joined by Leong Chu, Director of the Advanced Imaging Centre at the HHMI Janili Research Campus, and we discuss what makes Janilia so special. As a microscopist, uh, you, you know, it's, it's very hard to find another position that is more exciting than to make uh, technology develop and genially available to, to the rest of the world with, without any cost. Moving from the tropical climate of Malaysia to Wisconsin. The first day I arrive in Wisconsin, um, that is the day when the University of Wisconsin shut down for the first time in 20 years uh, because of a blizzard. <laughs> And everybody thought, well, this guy's not going to make it. (laughs) Really unexpected violin recitals. People actually bought tickets to hear me play without me realizing it. And at the end, I was like, wait, why do people pay pay tickets to, to listen to me? That's crazy. And his work disseminating microscopy skills and knowledge in Africa. If you make the microscopy opportunity uh, equally accessible, it, it will not be equitably accessed. All oh, in this episode of The Microscopist. Hi, and welcome to this episode of The Microscopist. I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York, and today I'm joined by Leong Chu from the Harold Hess Research Campus uh, at Janelia Farm. How are you? Good. Um, very well. Happy New Year, Peter. Uh, thanks for having me. Happy New Year. And I forgot, it's, it's Janelia Research Campus, isn't it? Not Janelia. It is Campus. Janelia Research Campus, yes. Yes. So, <laughs> why did it change its name? Um, it's a long story. Actually, do you know the, the history of, of uh, Janelia Farms? <clears throat> Not intricately. Well. Okay. So, um, Janelia is an autonomous uh, uh, research campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And and when they decided to do to, to build this campus, um, it was uh, early 2000, and they were looking for an area where they can actually build this research campus. And the area has to be, you know, in a way zoned for biological research uh, purposes. And then <clears throat> after a lot of uh, searches, and they finally, to make a long story very short, they finally found this place. And it was originally owned by the owned by the uh, Pickens family, and the Pickens family had uh, two daughters, uh, Jane and Cornelia, hence the name Janelia Farms. Um, so, <clears throat> and, and so when Howard Hughes Medical Institute bought this piece of land, they decided to to uh, you know adopt this uh, very cute and, and and endearing name of Janelia Farms. And I think right after I joined Janelia, which I believe is 2014 or 15 uh, at the time, and they decided to, to remove the word farms to, to, to make it you know, fit the, the, the research uh, uh, purposes of, of, of uh, or research mission of Janelia better than having the word farms in, in the name. <clears throat> but it stuck, it was quite good. Well, it still sticks. It, it is stuck. <laughs> So it wasn't such a bad thing. It's a great story as well. So where were you before Janelia? Uh, I was at uh, in, at uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. So um, why the move to Janelia? I think it's an obvious answer, but I've got to. Oh, ask. that that's a very obvious answer, right? Um, <clears throat> and and I don't think that as a microscopist, uh, you, you know, it's it's very hard to find another position that is more exciting than to make uh, technology develop and genially available to, to the rest of the world with, without any cost. And frankly, that is uh, the Advanced Imaging Center um, was at the time um, uh, sort of the prototype uh, open access um, microscopy facility for the rest of the world. And frankly, nobody knows how to run it. Um, it, it is, there's no precedent of, 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 uh, for, for this kind of, of open access. Uh, shared resource for microscopy. So I thought, wow, that is not only exciting, it is challenging, it's intimidating. Sign me up. (laughs) And you say there's no cost, but there's obviously a cost, but that's covered by? Um, The 
the, the Advanced Imaging Center for the past eight years has been jointly sponsored by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, and, and for those who don't know who, who Gordon Moore is, he's the founder of Intel. And I'm sure you have heard of the Moore's Law if you're interested in, in electronics and computer science. Um, so that's the Moore. And so why, why for, for the lay audience uh, that are not dedicated microscopists like ourselves, why is having access to these microscopes so important? What, what is different about what you're offering than you can get from my facility in York, for example? Um, so you, you know that the microscopy technology is developing leaps and bounds. It's really fast. And, and I think for in this renaissance of microscopy, if you will, I think the development of microscopy has significantly outpaced the, the commercialization process. And, and even though commercialization process is the ultimate uh, most efficient uh, way of disseminating technology, but they just cannot keep up. And so, and if you look at the, the, the process of commercialization, sometimes an instrument will take a good eight years, 10 years before it can be commercialized from the time it was published. And so the rest of the world will be waiting for transformative technologies such as this um, and, and, and to no avail. And the AIC was set up or the Advanced Imaging Center was set up precisely to, to, to fill this gap uh, before the instrument is, is, is commercialized. So <clears throat> AIC only house pre-commercial instrument uh, that you, is not available anywhere else in the world. And, and so when the commercial technology uh, and, and that's when the AIC begins. It doesn't mean that every single experiment has to be done at the Advanced Imaging Center. In fact, most of the experiment can be done in an excellent imaging center such as yours. Um, but when, you, when the biologists need to push that envelope uh, for something smaller, deeper, faster, gentler, uh, that is when uh, people come to, 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 to the AIC. And how, how, why is it that you get all the new technology? How come it's the Janelia? And all these new, really cool technologies that, that and, and your wording was right, they're transformative. They enable biological researchers in all walks of biological research mm -hmm. to address questions that couldn't be addressed without it. Mm -hmm. How does Janelia get these technologies first? Um, it is, I think, in a way, because of the way HHMI uh, fund uh, research, especially at Janelia. Um, we don't have a study section just like the NIH where you submit a grant to, to a predetermined uh, study section and you, you in a way have to fit the mission and the ethos of, of, the, of that study section before your, your grant can be funded. Here it is extremely, uh, you know, with, with extreme scientific freedom, if you will. <clears throat> So that a lot of the scientists at Genelia get to pursue what they want to do. And one of the things that um, Genelia pay attention to, and, and I think give significant amount of freedom, is tool building. Um, and this is one thing that I think is pretty unique to, to, to Genelia, especially in, in, in its early days. And, and in a way, we have attracted you know, many uh, uh, microscopy develop, developers and to Genelia. So it is, a, it's a, in fact, a very exciting place for, for microscopy development. So, and, and obviously on the microscopies, we've had Eric Betzig, we've had Harold Hess uh, being mm -hmm. two of those leading scientists. So you said you, when you joined there, it was intimidating. It was, I don't know, maybe scary. I know when I joined York, there was a microscopist called Justin Malloy. Mm -hmm. His reputation was really big. And I thought, oh, crikey, you know, I knew my <laughs> stuff, but he's a different league above me in his skill sets. You know, he's that mindset. Yeah, you've got Eric, you've got Harold, you've got, ha how do you cope with that? Because obviously that they are, I'm not judging your skills, but they must be very intimidating, not in their nature, but just in to be able to deliver what they want you to deliver in the AIC. Yes. It's a lot to learn. It's a lot to learn. And, and being in a microscopist, you can help, I feel like, an idiot every day at Genelia. <laughs> That's what my team think of me. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it, it, it is intimidating. It, and I think the, the more important word I think is humbling, uh, is how good they are and, and 
don't forget uh, also people like Philip Keller, uh, <clears throat> who just, you know, they just crank out one technology after another and, and, and it is humbling, it is exciting, absolutely. You get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, 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 get to, you get used to that feeling very quickly. <laughs> And I would probably argue, now I've talked to them, they can't answer back on this, that it's a very different skill in making that available to others. Yes. Uh, it's a very different skill set, a very different career path. Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. Um, it, it, because it, it's not so much technology uh, development, it's technology dissemination, right? So you, you actually do really need to work with a lot of biologists. And the most important thing is to um, just like, you know, what, what you're doing at your own imaging core facility, one, one of the most important tasks uh, or responsibility of a core director is to actually match the biological experiment with the right instrument and, 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 and maybe even, you know, help them design uh, uh, experiments that can be quantitative, that can challenge their own hypothesis um, to do all that appropriately. I think that, that's what we do. So just taking you back, you, you, you got to, in your current job from Chicago, where did your interest in microscopy start? In Chicago, actually. Okay. Uh, when, when, I was, when, when I was a postdoc. Um, so I, I developed uh, one of the earliest uh, FRET sensor to look at mycin like chain kinase activity. Um, and at that time, uh, we didn't really have a, a good microscope uh, to be able to, to, to uh, generate the data that we want to do, especially to work with that biosensor that I've generated. And, and in fact, that is when I really picked up a lot of the, uh, my, my, my microscopy uh, knowledge. So what was your first degree in? Uh, my undergraduate degree is uh, microbiology and biochemistry. I, I double majored. And then uh, <clears throat> when I was a uh, uh, PhD candidate, I was uh, in molecular pathology by looking at cytoskeletal rearrangement in endothelial cells. Uh, <clears throat> and then um, I, I continue on that my, my passion on, uh, in uh, uh, cytoskeleton reg regulation. And by the time I get to postdoc, I decided to look at the, the spatial temporal resolution of, of cytoskeleton. That's, you, you, you can't avoid microscopy. <laughs> yeah, um, I with a project like that. <clears throat> yeah, no, my, my PhD was in a cytoskeleton uh, spectrum for blood cell. Yeah. And I avoided microscopy for as long as I could. Uh, and then realized actually it's quite good. <laughs> but, yes. Same yeah, I was here. in my PhD uh, before I realized that microscopy was actually a lot better than I used to use in the uh, teaching labs or at school. Yeah. Uh, so when you went in to do microbiology, biochemistry, uh, why, why do you choose life sciences in that case? What did you want to be at the age of 10? When I, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so I grew up in Malaysia. So there is not a lot of uh, basic science, especially uh, when I was growing up. Um, so the, I, I, I've always interested in life science. I'm always interested in biology. <clears throat> and then, so at that time, the only natural career path uh, is, is going to medical school. Uh, and I didn't get into medical school. And so I was uh, a little uh, down. Um, and so I decided to um, come to the United States um, to pursue my dream. Um, and, and, and I decided to, to switch path because it's, it's actually extremely difficult to get into the medical school in the United States as a foreigner. And also, unlike the British uh, or the European system, you don't go into medical school right out right after high school. You you, you have to go through the, the undergraduate program. And so I decided to to go into biochemistry uh, and first, and then when I arrived at the University of Wisconsin, I de I decided to, to also uh, major in microbiology as well. Okay, so you mentioned Malaysia. You sent me some pictures. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> I presume it's from Malaysia. Yes. That that is my what hometown. Is this picture? That's my hometown. Uh, this is the northern part of my hometown, and it's an island. It's a tropical island. Uh, it's actually uh, one of the top ten most uh, livable cities in the world, um, and, and and it constantly ranked top five as one of the top five places to retire. So, hint hint, <laughs> uh, and and it's called Penang. 
and is one of the uh, important posts in, in, in the uh, ancient uh, spice route. And so that that's together with Singapore Penang is, is another uh, important outpost. Spice route. It, it looks very modern. There's a lot of high rise, modern looking buildings here. And yet you also have uh, yeah, uh, this is the <clears throat> this is a, a, a UNESCO uh, World Heritage uh, site. Actually, one of the highest concentration of uh, UNESCO heritage sites uh, on, on the planet. Um, and so, this is uh, the colonial area. I'm not sure if you remember. There is a, a movie starring uh, Jodie Foster and Chow Yun Fat. I think it's not The King and I, or that something like that. And that was completely filmed in my hometown. That's pretty cool. And you're obviously, because it's an island, you have an affection mm -hmm. for the sea, I presume? Yes, of course. Can, can get away from the ocean. <laughs> uh, and you did tell me bit, one bit of uh, street art, which I presume, yes. is this in your hometown as well? This is my hometown as well. I, I, I thought this was really smart. Yeah, so um, Penang is also one of the most Instagram cities in the world. I think it, it ranked actually higher than New York City itself. Um, so there are a lot of street artists, and this particular one is actually uh, created by a Lithuanian artist. Uh, his name is uh, Ernest uh, Zakarovich, and so he he one of the signature uh, one of his signatures, if you will, is to always combine uh, a real uh, real item in this case a bicycle uh, with with uh, painting, and he he always liked to paint children. So you can clearly see that a. a, a slightly older sister and his younger brother uh, as were actually painted on the wall uh, and then riding a bicycle that is lean against the wall uh, on, on which the, the, the painting was created. So it's a combination of painting and a real object. Yeah, and, and the bike is still there, whereas I'm sure actually- if it was The in bike London, is still there. Yeah, if it was in London, I'm not sure, so sure it would be. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it is actually not locked or secure. The bike is just lean on a wall. <laughs> So you said you'd like to, I, I presume you said you'd like to retire to Malaysia. Was that a hint in there? Say that again? Did you say you'd like to retire back to Malaysia? Uh, I'm not sure if I will retire back in Malaysia yet, but that's certainly an option. <laughs> so how did you find the move going from Malaysia to the US? Um, very drastic. Um, the, uh, Malaysia is, is a tropical uh, 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 country, as you know. We, my, my hometown is only about 500 miles away from the equator. <clears throat> um, so we don't have seasons, so it's yep. constantly hot and humid. And the first day I arrive in Wisconsin, um, that is the day when the University of Wisconsin shut down for the first time in 20 years uh, because of a blizzard. <laughs> And everybody thought, well, this guy's not going to make it. <laughs> he's going <laughs> to he's going to pack everything up and go home. <laughs> you must have found that exciting, surely. Oh, I, I love every second of it. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think of the weather now then? Uh, I just actually spent half an hour shoveling snow, so I, I, I'm sick and tired of the white stuff. <laughs> Do you not like the seasons? I think the same. I love the season. I absolutely love the season. It's just that the, uh, we, we have been shoveling snow quite a bit this season. So, yeah, but but even just seasonal changes. Oh, absolutely. Something I love lovely. It. Absolutely. I love it. Um, especially the fall and, and winter too, actually. Uh, and you have another passion, thinking of countries uh, uh, with Africa itself. Mm -hmm. and this this mm -hmm. is. Why, why the passion with Africa? I think the passion, <clears throat> my passion to Africa has to be attributed to uh, one, one of the, actually one of our earliest advanced microscopy fellows. So this is actually a program that I have emulated from Jennifer Waters, with whom you have interviewed before, and which is to, to train uh, to, to provide a specific training program for people who aspire to become a, 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 a director of microscopy somewhere to, to be able to own their, to, you know, to be able to run their own microscopy uh, center uh, one day. And so I started this program and our very first fellow is uh, Michael Rika, uh, who actually uh, came from South Africa and, um, and sort of get me to focus more on a lot of the resource challenged uh, uh, regions in the world. And, and 
and in a way, this is this opened up my eyes to some of the blind spot that we have had uh, at, at the Advanced Imaging Center. And, and I think overall, our even though our technology dissemination has been pretty successful, it has focused mainly on the developed world. And the more I look at the, 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 the data, the more I look at the map together with Mike, and the more we realize that if you if you make the microscopy <clears throat> Uh, opportunity uh, equally accessible, it, it will not be equitably accessed uh, by, by all the scientists from all over the world. So in, in, in various regions of the world, you actually have to lend a helping hand. So in, in early 2020, we organized uh, a workshop uh, called Imaging Africa that is uh, unique in, in many ways. Uh, because we actually uh, make it available to live scientists, uh, only uh, live scientists uh, in, 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 in um, Africa. Uh, this is uh, an all expense paid uh, workshop, um, thanks to the, the sponsorship of, of HHMI, the Moore Foundation, uh, the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, and, and several others. And so we were there for about a week. Um, and the workshop only has, has uh, 24 openings. Uh, we actually received more, more than 700 applications. Wow. Um, so that is a, a very strong signal that this is some, we have hit on something important and we need to do more about it. And, and, and I, I become extremely passionate about doing more in Africa. And, and so um, we, we have started something even bigger called the Africa Microscopy Initiative that also not only have the educational uh, uh, outreach elements, but also uh, we're going to build an imaging center uh, in Africa. Again, model after the AIC where people can access the, the instrument uh, <clears throat> via proposal submission peer reviewed. And then if your proposal is successful, you can come to that imaging center and we will cover the cost of your experiment. We will cover the cost of your travel and we will cover the cost of your lodging. Uh, when you come come to uh, um, that imaging center, um, which uh, will be uh, housed in University of Cape Town. And in addition to all that, we are also uh, working with several other companies to try to uh, create an instrument distribution program um, so that we can uh, distribute some of the pre-owned uh, instrument that are serviced up to, to, to the standard of, of the company and then uh, distributed in, in, in Africa. And then this, this particular picture um, is actually a very interesting event. So this is actually a, an outreach event within an outreach event. So while we were in Cape Town running the Imaging Africa workshop, um, <clears throat> and, and I'm not sure if you've ever been to Cape Town, but in between the, the airport and the very ritzy area of, of downtown Cape Town, you, you drive for miles and miles across this, uh, what they will call the township, which is the, 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 the relics of the, the very, very oppressive apartheid regime, right? So this is areas where they, they have, you know, um, devised this, this uh, racial engineering and social engineering programs that put all the non-white people <clears throat> into this township. And a lot of these kids, uh, you know, grow up in this, this kind of township, uh, have very limited upward mobility. Uh, but there is uh, several youth groups um, that are mainly made up of, of uh, graduate students in Cape Town. And they go into this neighborhood, talk to the local high school teacher and try to identify students with very high potentials and try to give them a helping hand, give, give them a chance to, to expose them to how to do scientific research and the impact of scientific research and, and teach them social media skills so that they can actually tell their own story from township. So when we were there, we, we thought, well, since we have 24 creme de la creme, you know, young scientists that we have selected from more than 700 applicants uh, congregating in Cape Town to take this workshop, um, what better role model can we find uh, throughout Africa who are close to this, the, the, the age of this kid? And then so we decided to work with the youth groups and then we bring in, we brought in, uh, I think, 20 uh, this kids from, from, from uh, the township. And so they get to talk to the to the, the, the students at the workshop as well as the teaching international teaching faculty, and then we give them a backpack. Uh, inside the backpack, there was this uh, fold scope that uh, Manu Prakash developed. So this picture basically shows you the kids are folding folding the uh, the the fold scope. So they they actually 
every single one of them get to take a, micro, a little uh, foldable origami microscope back to their to their home and share it with their friends. I thought it was interesting. You, you mentioned that one of the things you were teaching them was was social media. Uh, so communication. Why is that so important? I think it is important because <clears throat> when the local kids tell their own story or bring the, uh, you know, the, 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 the overall concept of how biomedical research is done and why is it impactful, um, especially for you know, various disease-ridden uh, regions in, in Africa, um, they, they, they gain a good following and they gain a, a, a trusty audience rather than a, a foreigners coming in trying to tell them about Western medicine. Um, and, and, and more importantly, they grow up with a lot of the problems, um, you know, how to deal with, with infectious disease, how to deal with crime, how to deal with, with the lack of upward mobility. And so I don't think you can find a, a better uh, narrator to tell that story than, than, than those kids. And they are very passionate. They're extremely talented. Um, so yeah, they, they, frankly, the best candidates possible. Yeah, so the importance of making the community, the importance of communication and making it relatable Mm -hmm. uh, to, to kind of help inspire and yep. yeah, get the next generation of scientists yep. developed. You sent me a couple more pictures, so obviously you can see this. Oh, this is the fun day. So this is after two weeks of uh, pretty hard work trying to get the workshop running and for the first time. And this is uh, we were this is the last day when we all the faculties as well as the students were under a tent in Camps Bay in, in, in uh, Cape Town where we have our last group dinner together. And finally, one more, which was, yeah, so you were the Cape of Good Hope, even I can read. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we have a couple of the AIC members. There is Satya and there is Jesse there. And on the extreme left is Klaus Hahn uh, from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, so he, as you probably know, as a microscopy, he has developed quite a few uh, FRET sensors, especially on the P32 GTPases, a P21 GTPases. And so he's actually one of the uh, uh, teaching faculty members as well. So we, we decided that right before the workshop starts, after we have done all the preparatory work, we need a day of fun. <laughs> yeah. And so how often do you plan to go over? Say that again. Will you be going over again yourself? Because obviously you've got training. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, there, will you... the, 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 the second Imaging Africa workshop was actually originally planned for the October of 2021. Uh, clearly, that didn't happen uh, because of pandemic. And, and I'm, I'm very sure that this year is going to be delayed as well. But uh, again, but we... we we remain optimistic uh, and we, we plan for October of 2022. So we're, we're, we're not giving up, we're going back. And are you still seeking different funders, different sponsors to come in with the others? Because it sounds quite good. You've got a diverse set of sponsors, yeah. which actually yeah. makes it more resilient to yes. change. Uh, but I presume you'd welcome more sponsors on this. Oh yeah, we we well we 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 always want to increase the uh, the, the diversity of of, of uh, funding sources for sure. And, and it is good for sustainability. It's good for visibility. Um, yeah, and, and and I know the answers to some of these. So, but I, I think it is worth mentioning. You mentioned to start with that you would open the call out at AIC to start with for people to come to Genelia, use the equipment. And although it's open, generally the buyers would go to well-developed, wealthy countries that are coming in. Mm -hmm. How does the science compare? when you get those from developing countries compared to the developed countries. Are, they, are the scientists as good as they are? Oh yeah, there? absolutely, absolutely. And, and I, I wouldn't compare them as to who is better. I would, I would compare them as to the, um, the focus of research. Um, the focus of research is, is, is slightly different. Uh, they are more focusing on, on um, uh, infectious disease and also, um, you know, environmental uh, issues as well as the also agricultural science, uh, things like that, um, soil biology and, 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 you know, issues such as that. Um, but the, the, the quality of science uh, doesn't change. The one thing that is different and which actually prompted us to, to, to do more in Africa is that they 
a lot of them do not have the necessary tools to generate preliminary data uh, that we are looking for. Um, and, and you know, if you're in the United States or in Europe, um, if you need a confocal, you need a spinning disk or any microscope, you will you'll get it and you will generate the preliminary data without a second thought. Um, and, and but in Africa and in you know the India subcontinent and Southeast Asia and, and sometimes even in Latin America, um, that is not easy to come by. Um, but the, the quality of science, the impact of science is is the same. I think that's a really important message though. Mm -hmm. because I think there has been always a, a, a historic perception. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that needs to be recognized and, and yeah. addressed as yeah. you're doing with training up as well, but to address yeah. that the science is still yeah. very worthy. Uh, as you know, anyway, we do quite a lot of work uh, with collaborators across Africa mm -hmm. uh, who are leading the projects. Uh, we are just a tool to them in some cases, because again, we have the equipment, but they have the expertise. Yeah, absolutely, and and I, I would love to, to 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 find a way to collaborate with 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 all the uh, the, the initiative that you have you have uh, spearheaded in Africa. I think that would no, be I've not I've not spearheaded it. Others have spearheaded it. I've just <laughs> so I can't take any credit for it. Still, we we <laughs> should work together. Uh, so who, who in your who in your career then who's been your inspiration or inspirations? Uh, maybe that's slightly different to who motivates you or what motivates you? So two questions coming in. Maybe start with the motivation. What motivates you to go to work and aspire to be the best? And who have been your inspirations? Um, believe it or not, what motivates me to go to work is actually Janelia itself. Uh, it, it really is a special place. Um, and, and even until today, sometimes I walk down the grand staircase, you know, coming in from, from the parking lot and coming down and, and I still pinch myself. Uh, it's hard to believe that I work at Geneva, but. It is a kind of a dream place to work, isn't it? It is. And that, that and EMBL are two of the. Oh my God. Yes, absolutely. Right. There, there are several others. There, there are a few truly, you know, magical places and signs in the world. And, and Geneva happens to be one of them. Yeah, no, very amazing. What about your inspirations then? Um, wow, that's an, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, who inspired me? Um, quite a few, because when, when I, I think when I was a postdoc, I, you know, I, I, being a cell biologist, that, that uh, there are quite a few of them who are now actually my colleagues. In a way, I, I call myself extremely lucky to be, be able to work with them. Uh, they kind of used to be my idols. Um, Klaus Hans is one of them, Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, right? Eric Batsik. Um, I, I, I like the way you say they used to be your idols. So now they, you don't care for them, though. No? Well, that's not <laughs> what I said. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, th th those are, you know, a few of, of my heroes, if you will. Um, quite a few of them, actually. Um, and Gary yeah. Borisi, who start to who actually, uh, you know, sort of started my, my, my entire career in, in core facility, who, who was the first one who encouraged me to, to go into uh, um, core facilities. So, so you get very fortunate. You're very, very lucky to be where you are, to be able I to am. work with. I am. All these inspirations <laughs> in the community. Some quick fire questions. Uh, I've got a PC or Mac? Uh, I'm a Mac person. Okay, so McDonald's or Burger King? Oh boy. <laughs> uh, McDonald's, I guess. Okay. Uh, Malaysia or USA? Um, depends on what you're asking. Where's food? Malaysia. Okay. Prefer to live? Place to live. Um, I would say Malaysia. It's okay. I'm just losing your American passport and you, do, you, were gonna, you couldn't win whatever way if anyone's listening to this on that, that front. Mm. Early bird or night owl? Early bird. Actually, very early bird. Uh, go on. What time do you normally get up? I usually get up at five, and uh, if it is in the summer, I start running at 5.30 or so. Uh, so what's your distance when you run? Uh, 10K during the week and maybe 15K during the weekend. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I do two shorter runs, so 10K, and then a long run at the weekend as well. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, wait, what other sports do you do? Uh, I kayak. Um, I actually also have an indoor rower. Um, I hike. I, I, uh, I don't have a lot of opportunity to hike, but, but uh, I, I love to hike whenever I can. I think you, did you send me a picture of hiking? Just a picture of you. Yeah, this Sorry, is I've in, uh... <laughs> Not the best picture, sorry, the way it's come on to No Zoom. problem. This, this is in Patagonia. I think this is the Chilean side of Patagonia, uh, Torres del Paine, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And this was hiking in the snow? No. This, we, uh, my wife and I actually took a helicopter up. Um, uh, this, uh, in the distance, right in the center is Mount Cook. So this is the, the, the South Island of New Zealand. And you, so you like hiking and you took a helicopter to the top. Uh, that's yeah, I cheated, so. <laughs> definitely cheating. And just thinking about, I've gone off the quick fire, other hobbies. I believe that this is one of your hobbies, which is a this, violin. Yeah. This is a violin. Yeah. Um, this is uh, a very old violin. Uh, it was, uh, it's a French violin uh, made by uh, Nicolas Augustin Chapuy. Uh, it is made in 1783, I believe. Wow. Yeah, so to put, it, to put it in perspective, I think Beethoven was only 13 years old when this violin was made. So, um, so this is, this is the, the glamour shot of the violin before I, we, we put all the chin rest and everything on it. <laughs> so this is your violin? Yes. Wow. And this is you playing the violin. This is me playing the violin. Uh, this is at the uh, Finnish and Swedish border. I think um, this is one, uh, one of the islands on the archipelago of Finland uh, in the summer. So the island is called Wester. Um, so. so, cool. So how good are you? Oh, okay. I'm presuming you're going to be very good, being as you've got a, a really special historic violin. <laughs> Surely you can play it well. I think well. <laughs> the funniest thing about the last picture was that that was actually a ticketed event that I was not aware of. So people actually bought tickets to hear me play without me realizing it. And at the end, I was like, wait, why do people pay, pay tickets to, to listen to me? That's crazy. <laughs> So I was there. I was in in, in Turku in Finland uh, teaching a, a, a microscopy workshop at the time, and then they say, "Well, you know, there, there is this venue um, that they in the summer they actually combine uh, dinner and 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 classical music recital. Would you like to play?" And I said, "Well, sure, why not?" And and I just decided to go play, and not knowing that it was a ticketed event. Wow. That, that was uh, luckily they they didn't tell me until the end because I would have. I would have freaked out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so thinking about your evening meal then, what's your favorite food? Um, oh, so many. Uh, Mediterranean food, Japanese food, and, and Malaysian curry. Okay. What food do you not like? Uh, I don't, I'm a foodie. I, I don't think I have any food that I really don't like much. I, I guess I don't like food that are too oily uh, so I, I don't eat a lot of meat i'm not a vegetarian but i don't eat a lot of meat that's interesting so when i ask you mcdonald's or burger king you hesitate does that mean you do do but mcdonald's once in a while when i'm desperate <laughs> breakfast or dinner uh lunch sometimes okay yeah tea or coffee coffee beer or wine Wine, for sure. Red or white? Usually white. Oh, okay. Any particular grape? Uh, I like the, the wine coming from the Alsace area. So uh, Riesling, Gewürz, Tramina, and, and Pinot Gris uh, are, are some of my, my, my favorite. And, and I, the more I, I, I tasted wine, the more I'm gravitating towards wine coming from the Southern Hemisphere these days. Okay. And to accompany that, cheese or beer? Uh, cheese or chocolate? Cheese or beer? Cheese or chocolate? Can I say both? I suppose you can. That'd be a bit crackers, but that's what you have with the cheese. I, I, I love both chocolate and, 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 and cheese. That's fair enough. So, 
carrying on back back to your motivations and inspirations what's been the biggest challenge that you've faced at work or in the work environment uh, <clears throat> of your career so far it depends on where depends on where you're talking about uh Outside of Janelia, when I was at Northwestern, certainly funding, right? Um, and 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 you know as well as I do that a lot of uh, federal funding agencies they keep funding hardware, but they rarely fund people. Um, and and not knowing that you know people is sometimes even more important than the hardware itself. Uh, it's the expertise that make or break uh, a core facility, and so. <clears throat> This has this this has this has always been been my 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 challenge when I was at Northwestern is to to get people to recognize that it, you know funding expertise is extremely important and and NIH still hasn't come around after so many years um, and in a way I have to you know give give funding agencies such as the, the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative a, a lot of kudos for for recognizing that um, and then. Um, at the AIC, the biggest challenge is to raise the awareness of, of um, opportunities such as the AIC. Um, and I still remember very clearly when they asked me the same questions when I interview at, 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 uh, at Genelia, what, what do you foresee to be the biggest challenge of running the Advanced Imaging Center? I said, if you build it, they won't come. <laughs> And they, they looked at me, you know, incredulously, but uh, unfortunately, it turned out to be true. Um, you actually have to go out and convince people that there is no catch, that this is real. Uh, <clears throat> it took me a good two or three years. I mean, that first two or three years, um, just to run around the whole world, trying to convince people that, you know, there is no catch in this AIC model, and this is truly as good as it sounds. Uh, it's pretty much the bane of my existence for, <laughs> for a few years. Uh, that that was rough. Um, so you were my microscopist to a salesman. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it is that hybrid role, isn't it? It, and, it is a hybrid role. Um, in, in in a way, even if you tell people, they got excited, <clears throat> but they never take the extra step to 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 apply. Um, you actually have to <clears throat> sit down with them and talk to them about their, 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 their project, what they are working on, and then tell them, hey, if you use this instrument, you can actually get this answer very, very quickly and quantitatively. And that is when the light bulb finally, they finally make that connection and the light bulb matter. And how long can they visit for? Uh, two to three weeks, sometimes longer. Um, a very important point is everybody thought that, well, a short visit also equals a one-time visit, which is actually not true. Uh, AIC actually entertain a lot of return visits. Um, in a way, two or three weeks is more than sufficient for a, a, a one-round visit because you generate a lot of data. Uh, you have to actually go back and, and, and you know, process it and digest it and think about it before you can do a follow-up experiment. Um, so... We do, we do uh, entertain a lot of return projects. <clears throat> of course, there's a lot of pre-prep. There's a lot of communication beforehand. So when they arrive, you hit the road running and they don't, they're not making terrible errors in the first week, writing yes. that off, I presume. Yes, absolutely. Anything that doesn't have to be troubleshooted in, in at Genelia, please don't do the troubleshooting at Genelia because there is enough troubleshooting to do at Genelia <laughs> at, 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 the, at the AIC. <clears throat> And what's been the most fun? So they're, they're the challenges you've had to face. Yes. What's been the most exciting, most fun time of your career? Uh, I would say running the Advanced Imaging Center uh, because you actually get to see the cross-section of science, global science, not just in the United States, but you can see how science coming from different areas um, has a different flavor to it. Uh, that is very different, even though, even though they may be working on the exact same project. For example, um, let's say take, you know, infection of tuberculosis, for example, here in, in, in the Western world, you tend to study malaria, tuberculosis or something as a disease by itself. <clears throat> uh, uh, coming from Africa, people tend to study co-infection. Somebody who has been, uh, that are HIV positive and at the same time infected by, by tuberculosis. And that changes the pathology and the biology of both diseases at the same time. And so they, 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 they even though everybody kind of studied the same thing, there is a slight 
slant to it um, that is different from, from regions to regions of the world. And you get to meet people, right? No, and no, you actually get to learn a lot of organisms that I've never heard of before. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to a degree, I, I tend to, it all boils down to uh, what do they want to see and what's their fluorochromes? Yes, exactly. And how deep and how fast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so thinking about communication and the importance of communication, how many, are you still struggling to get applicants to come in or now you heavily oversubscribed? How's that now doing? Um, <clears throat> I think AIC is on the right track. It, 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 we're doing fine now. Um, proposals keep coming in. And in fact, uh, you know, just, just this week alone, we're going to have three or four technical consultation. Um, so we actually provide an, an hour long technical consultation before people submit their proposal, um, just to make sure that, you know, we, we want to maximize everybody's uh, success rate. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the request for technical consultation continue to come in. Um, that I, I, I think the initial hump we, we have gotten over. So in a way that's good. And again, extending communication further. Uh, I, I, my visit to Danili was to the inception of bioimaging North America, DINA, mm -hmm. uh, for which you, I, th I think you organized that inception of it. <laughs> I, I didn't organize that inception. I organized a workshop uh, during which the idea of Bina came about. And, and, and in fact, the, the, the very first meeting, informal meeting of the, of the original members of the executive committee was, was conducted at Genelia during that conference in, in which you, 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 you attended. <clears throat> Why is Bina so important? For many reasons. Um, <clears throat> So if you look across the world, um, many commu uh, microscopy communities across the world have organized, right? Um, Australia has clearly have a very, very well organized structure. The Europeans have Eurobioimaging. Um, but yet United States has if arguably the largest you know, microscopy community in the world, um, you know, with thousands of, of, of imaging center. And yet the, the, the community at the time was very scattered. Um, we don't have a collective voice. Uh, we don't have a, an organization that sort of, uh, you know, pay attention to, to, the, to the welfare, the career trajectory of uh, core directors and to, to, to have a dialogue partner with various funding agencies, for example, that has a unified voice. And so it, it is extremely important for a community like this to, to sort of <clears throat> form a body that is well-organized where the voices can be heard. And so we, we thought the time was right, actually it was well past the time uh, uh, for, for us to, to, to get this, or this community organized together. And, and it, it, that idea starts to percolate and it, and, and it becomes louder and louder within a two or three day period uh, during that conference that at the end we decided that I, I think something has to be done, so. <clears throat> and, and is it moving fast enough? It started out a little slow because we, we, we certainly need to get uh, funding. Um, and in a way, we, we, Bina is, 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 is very lucky, uh, and, but in fact, well-deserved as well. Um, and and we, they, uh, Bina finally is, is funded by the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative. And so now the organization actually have the resources uh, to, to do a lot of the activities that they have, we, we have been planning for quite a while. Uh, which, which is which is excellent and actually really important. You mentioned earlier about funders paying for equipment, but not staff. And it is getting that political influence back to the funders directly, the big funders directly, and having that influence at that level. Mm -hmm. I think the UK is really receptive. So our research councils are, so UK are is very receptive. Uh, Ottilene Lizer was actually one of the guests on the microscopists and, and she, very engaged with the core activities, not just a microscopy, but many other technologies. Mm -hmm. But the funders attend our meetings. You know, we don't just, yeah. They don't just have our voice on some of their committees, but they also attend our meetings and listen to the community. And I hope, and I, I know that Bina's objective is to get there. It isn't, it, it, it does take time. Yeah. Uh, and it needs, yeah, tenacity. Mm -hmm. to, going at it and I, I the vision and collaboration and 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 you know it, this is a it, it takes a village right it's a group effort yeah. everybody has to be involved and the right network 
and the right network and and a lot of peer networks as, as well and in a way is like you know another advantage of, of having Bina is that now the the North American community actually can interact more more you know in a, in a more organized fashion with, with their European counterparts with with Australian counterparts and, and elsewhere and 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 I think you you will also uh, hear that uh, I, actually the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative has already announced that um, there is now an African bioimaging uh, consortium, uh, sort of a BINA equivalent in, in Africa. And then there is also now a BINA equivalent uh, in South uh, America as well. So um, hopefully we'll hear from them at some point as well with Karen and Lionel. We'll yeah, you, you, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you should definitely interview them. On board and see, see where they're going. Some more, some, back to some more personal questions sure, uh, sure. I haven't asked you. Book or TV? Book. Book. What are you reading at the moment? Uh, I am reading. I, so one genre that I actually i am crazy about, and, and it's just really weird, is I actually like inter, international espionage novels a lot. <laughs> Uh, probably because I, I travel a lot. So I actually, when you talk about this street and that neighborhood and in various cities in the world, I kind of say, oh, okay, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you travel the world under the guise of my cross whereas actually you just want to be an international spy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can we, can we cut this part out? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so what about your favorite movie? Uh, my favorite movies, there are two or three. I, uh, there is a German movie that I really like. It's very philosophical and, and uh, it's called The, Life of, uh, the Lives of Others. Uh, that's Leben der Anderen. Uh, it, it came out, I think, in, 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 two, in the 2000s. Uh, I, I love that movie. And it is about uh, 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 <clears throat> Basically, an Eastern European, uh, you know, uh, Stasi uh, officer who just sitting there in somebody's attic, just listening to people's conversation. And it, it started out with the the, the couple that uh, this guy, this officer, was listening to, and the guy is a pianist. And he basically said that you know, Stalin's favorite uh, piano work is Beethoven's Appassionata uh, Piano Sonata. But he will never let himself listening to it because that will give him uh, compassion, and he may just change his mission. And so the, the 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 philosophical questions that was being probed in that movie was: if you listen to music in now, will it change your outlook? And this guy keep playing music and music over and over and over again, and it somehow affects the the, the Stasi's. Uh, uh, mindset as he was spying on them. So it's a very interesting philosophical exploration of, of the effects of music. And then the other movie that I really like is uh, Woody Allen's uh, Midnight in Paris. I've, I've, I've never seen it. I've only enjoyed one or two Woody Allen movies. All the others, I think I've never got to the end without falling asleep. Ah, well, this one, Woody Allen is not in it. <laughs> That's fairly I'm not sure if that helps, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's not him necessarily. It's, I don't know. Some movies brilliant, yeah. others just haven't ticked my box at all. So you like yeah. that was a particular favorite of yours? Yes, that I can think of right now. Yeah. And are you a messy or tidy person? Tidy. Yeah, I can tell that by your background. <laughs> it looks very sharp and clean. And what's your favorite type of music? Classical and uh, classical and jazz. I have to say. It's never a given, despite the beautiful background and, and your violin and everything else. You, you could have been into something else. Uh, who's your favorite, Harold or Eric? Wait, who is my favorite, what, composer? No, 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 scientist. Harold Hess or Eric Betsy? I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to get you into any trouble whatsoever, am I? Too? <laughs> So I asked you what you wanted to be when you were uh, 10 years old. What did you want to be when you were 25, 26? How about I answer your questions when I was about 17, 18 years? Yeah, yeah go. 
when I was 17, 18 years old, my dream job was to be a, 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 an orchestra conductor. That was like, I was all in. And of course, you know, being coming <laughs> from an Asian family, that, that's a pretty firm no very quickly from my father. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what would you like to be today? If it wasn't a microscopist, what would you like to be? If I'm not a microscopist, um, I would like to be involved in, in, in some sort of a job where I actually get to travel the world and be able to you know, talk to scientists, or it doesn't even have to be life scientists, just the scientists in general to see what they what they are facing and what I can do uh, if, if I'm representing a funding agency, for example. So you'd like to stay in science. You, you don't want to you don't want to be a conductor anymore. You don't want to fly off to. Yeah, now now that now that I've seen how how musicians struggle, <laughs> and I'm not I'm not a teenager anymore. So yeah, so that's a little bit of the you know. <laughs> reality sinking in i guess and people are listening to this that may maybe musicians thinking god i don't want to be a scientist because you can't yeah. get jobs in it you've got to travel the world people don't listen to you <laughs> and people are now treating you like a public enemy right <laughs> and especially in the united states because of covid and so finally because we are coming up to the hour mm -hmm. what's the next big thing in scientific research or microscopy take your pick or both um I think you are going to see um, bigger and bigger and bigger role uh, or integral role that uh, imaging probes will be playing in microscopy. Um, and in fact, if you look back, you, you don't even you don't even have to go back that far. Um, is uh, uh, even the, the 2014 uh, Nobel Prize for super resolution and, and pretty much, you know, all the techniques there play with probes, uh, the photophysics of probes to, yeah. to get the super resolution, right? <clears throat> and, and, and hence Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, and, and so I, I think you're gonna see that happen again and, 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 and um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and you're gonna see a lot more of that. And I think we're also gonna start marching towards, um, you know, tech imaging techniques that are label free, that really start to pay attention to other signaling cues that cannot be easily uh, imaged before, uh, such as uh, biomechanical forces, um, sugar moiety, for example, and, and things like that, that uh, people have completely overlooked, not because they are not important, but because there is no technology available to study. Uh, and so is that the chemistry of the probes that is going to move on, a, a manipulation of the probes? Uh, manipulation of the probe as well as um, imaging techniques, um, for example, you know, okay. plasmon-based techniques. And then uh, less and less and less perturbative technique to be able to study biomechanical forces, um, things like that. Just using okay. using using you know re refractive indices and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. We could talk about that one after as well. And probes remaining organic, or do you think we'll see more inorganics? Inorganic or well, organic dye, but but not but not genetically, but not necessarily genetically encoded. Yeah. So, Leong, we are up to the hour. So, oh, thank you very much. Time flies. <laughs> it really does fly. Thank you, everyone, for watching or listening. Thank you. Thank you very Please much. do remember to subscribe to the Microscopy, to whichever channel you're, or version channel you're listening on. And actually, I think Leong, throughout all of this, has dropped notes to Harold Hesse's podcast, Eric Betsy's podcast, Jennifer, you've been hearing about in her podcast. I should point out as well Stephanie Ott from Chan Zuckerberg who's funded so much of the research you've heard about today. Uh, UK funders, Ottoline Liza, and actually a, a shout out as well to Alison North with the Bina yeah. side on it as well with Kurt Anderson. So yeah, go and go listen to some of those past ones as well. Leon, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank and, you for having uh, me. I look forward to catching up in person again as soon as we can meet in person. Likewise. Thanks, Leon. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy.
To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.